Hello, Bio 20. Welcome to our introduction lesson. This lesson is going to be about a bunch of things that are going to show up throughout the course. So we're just going to touch lightly on them now to get our start on them and kind of bring them up as we go along. In your note package, you will follow along after your vocabulary. There should be a spot that starts talking about under lesson one. If you can see on my video here, let me see if I can do this. Lesson one, you should see a catalyst section. So as you follow along, you can either watch the whole video, then go back and do your notes or stop and pause it and start it again. It's up to you. We're going to talk about a catalyst. So a catalyst is something you've heard about probably in Science 9, Science 10. If you're taking Chem 20, you might have heard of it in there. Now, a catalyst is used to increase the rate of a reaction. It's used several times because it doesn't ever get used up. And because of it, we can use it again and again and again. In bio, the one that we're going to talk about is the organic catalyst called an enzyme. So enzymes are used throughout our body regularly, specifically, let's say, in digestion. And it helps us aid different processes as it goes along. So, for example, there's an enzyme that helps you break down sugars. There's lots of different sugars, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about digestion. But the picture I have here is just one example. Maltose, which is a disaccharide, a little bit more of a complex sugar, is being broken down using this one here into two glucoses. Now, this is the catalyst or the enzyme. It has an activation site or an active site right here and it has a substrate, that's the purple part here, okay? And what you'll see is that this enzyme is specific to this lovely, beautiful maltose molecule. And we're gonna get into why that's important. But for right now, what you have to understand is that enzymes are made up of proteins. And we're gonna talk a lot about the importance of that. As well as, it's important to understand that enzymes work at an optimal uh, level. So we're talking, if you're talking about your body, there's temperatures that are important, pHs that are important, but essentially in your body, the enzymes that have are there work at an optimal level at pH of seven, temperature of 37 degrees. It doesn't really like change. So why are enzymes necessary? It turns out chemical reactions are slow, especially in our body. And when it comes to eating food, for example, you would never be able to digest your food without an enzyme. Normally, we could increase the rate of a chemical reaction, like breaking down food or changing products, uh, sorry, reactants into different products, by increasing the temperature. You may remember back to rates of reaction in Science 9, where we take a little Alka-Seltzer pill, we throw it in hot water, and phew, it's gone, okay? It takes way longer in cold water and regular water because if you increase the temperature, it just goes faster. Now, this is actually a problem, this temperature increasing part. When we talk about biology, especially in bio 20, because we're talking about our body, you cannot increase your temperature. In fact, if you increase your temperature, then you should be clicking the symptoms part of COVID. Don't come, don't come to school if your temperature is increased, okay? But essentially, if you increase your temperature, you have a fever, and a fever is not safe. A fever of 104 degrees, Fahrenheit can actually land you in the hospital, okay? And if anything higher than that for long extended periods of time can actually cause delusions and eventually possibly brain damage. And that is because your brain is made out of proteins. At a high temperature, proteins denature, meaning they're normally stuck together in a really tight ball. And when they get overheated, they start to unravel and pull apart and then don't long, no longer work. If you have an enzyme that is supposed to match a specific substrate and it changes its shape, that enzyme and substrate can't match anymore and they're not gonna work. So normally we need to use enzymes to speed up the rate of reaction, especially in our body, because we cannot increase the temperature. Now, in your notes, there's a whole section about drawing a graph and all that stuff. We're gonna skip that. We're gonna leave that in our notes blank. We're gonna end up down to uh, the area that says enzymes are substrate specific. So a substrate is the molecule that attaches to the active site of the enzyme. There's tons and we're going to learn lots of them this year. But essentially it's just a fancy word for saying a molecule in your body. All right. Now the active site is the area where that enzyme meets that substrate. And they are specific to each other. We call that the lock and key mechanism. All right. So when they are matching and they fit together perfectly, 
only one enzyme will break down one substrate. It's no different than the keys to your house. If you took your key and tried to use your key on your best friend's house and you tried to use the key on, for the door, it's not going to work or the keys for the car. Okay. Your keys are cut specifically for your lock and that's how enzymes work. They're cut specifically for the substrate. So it says draw a picture to demonstrate that enzymes are specific for particular substrates. We're going to use the example right here. Here is an enzyme. It's got this lovely little wavy bump here. Okay. You're going to draw that. You're then going to draw this beautiful picture of sucrose. All right. And that's just showing you enzyme and substrate match. When we talk about enzymes, we give them special names because we want to understand what they're breaking down. So each enzyme is given a unique name because it acts on different specific substrates. So in the picture provided to you, you'll see that in the red marking, sucrase is the name of the enzyme. How do I know this? Because it ends in ASE. ASE usually represents all enzymes, mostly in bile. That's what we're going to use. And it's showing you that it matches specifically with sucrose. Okay, you can see that there, sucrose right here. The suc part of it right here matches the beginning part here. So you can tell what enzyme is breaking down what based off of its name. So that's really important when it comes down to later on when we talk about different types of enzymes and what breaks them down. If you can look at the name, you can usually deduce what it's breaking down. Enzymes... Okay, also work when this world of competitive and non-competitive. So we don't always want enzymes to be working. In fact, if they're always working, we'd always have reactions occurring. Sometimes we don't want that. So there's something called an inhibitor. An inhibitor or inhibit means to stop. So in the world of enzymes, you have competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. A competitive inhibitor will stop the reaction from occurring by binding directly to the active site. That's this picture right here. See how there's this lovely blue teardrop here? Now all of a sudden the substrate can't fix, we can't break it down, no reaction is occurring. A non-competitive inhibitor does something slightly different. Rather than binding to the active site, it finds a different area to bind to, and now it changes the shape of the enzyme. And as I said before, the lock and key. My key needs to match my lock. If they don't match, it's not going to work. This no longer, this substrate here no longer fits into this enzyme. So that presents a problem. We can no longer go through a reaction. But like I said, sometimes we don't want reactions to occur, so we use inhibitors to stop it. Now the problem with enzymes, and we will get more into this as we go through the chapters, is when they get too hot or when their pH is not correct, they denature. So what you're seeing there in the picture is there's a folded protein. Proteins are folded over and matched into all these different like globular structures. As soon as you start to heat that protein or you put it in the wrong pH, it's slowly going to start to unfold. What you see there is the unfolded protein. Unfortunately, if that protein is left unfolded for too long, it will never go back to the way it was supposed to be. And that's how come when you have a fever, if it lasts for too long, you can actually, and it's too high, so above 104, you can actually have brain damage because the proteins within your brain can unfold and never fold back properly. This is just a, some examples to see of how we can see actual denaturing occurring. You have the changing of the optimal temperature through the cooking of an egg. You can see there's a folded structure here, and as it denatures, it folds and unwinds into something else. And then here is your pH. Our body is full of different enzymes. Our pH is usually between a seven and an eight, except in our stomach when it's a two. If you put any enzyme in an area of your stomach, they're not gonna work because they don't work at that pH and they do the same thing and they unravel. I'm going to link in this video from the Amoeba Sisters. I would like you to watch it, it's short and it'll give you a good idea and a little bit more visuals on what enzymes are. Lastly, I want to talk about enzymes in the world of reduction and oxidation. So what you see here is enzymes or the biological catalysts that we talked about are needed to help with reactions. Okay. And so in the absence of enzymes, okay, reactions can occur and they get used up. So what ends up happening is we look at it as either an oxidation reaction or a reduction reaction. And for the purpose of this video only, you just need to remember this. If I'm losing electrons, it means I'm oxidized, so LEO. If I'm gaining electrons, it means I'm reduced. 
Essentially, ladies and gentlemen, we will talk more as we get closer to talking about NADPH reductase, ATP synthase, and we get into all these lovely names of things. We're going to talk about the movement of electrons because electrons contain energy. Okay. And you know this from science nine, you saw it in science 10. Okay. The movement of electrons will help with the movement of energy. So we're going to talk about when you lose or gain an electron, what does that look like in the world of bio? So hopefully you have all of these notes down and I will talk to you soon.